Hi, everybody. Welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm Father Tony Sylvia, and joining me, as always, is Reverend Mr. Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. And joining us to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have Dr. Glenn Farron of the U Farron, I'm sorry, of the University of Alberta. Welcome, Dr. Farron, and thank you for joining us. Oh, well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. All right, so let's jump right into it. What are the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, uh, well, the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, was a collection of uh, Greco-Roman Jewish texts discovered in, uh, I guess, modern-day Israel, uh, ranging anywhere from like 1945 to up until 56, I think was the last of the scrolls. Uh, and it's a collection that includes uh, pretty much every text, yeah, I believe every text from the Hebrew Bible, uh, with a bunch of extra, uh, really interesting things that uh, nobody had seen or heard of before. Uh, so yeah, it's a very interesting sort of, I guess, uh, wedge uh, of what uh, uh, some groups of folks that we would call uh, ancient Jews uh, were reading and collecting and preserving. Very cool. Can you tell us a little bit about you know how they were discovered and and was this uh, you know just viewed as uh, here's a bunch of dusty old books or was this a big deal in the scholarly community and um so this is actually a free park question and then was there was there any controversies about their discovery and their publication sure yeah there actually uh, there was a lot of controversy uh, when they were uh first discovered uh but there was a uh, discovery by accident uh some folks were uh around some caves and uh they uh, found there's a whole bunch of stories uh, affiliated with you know the rumors of how they were discovered some are quite salacious in detail it's it's, it's kind of it, it's not as interesting as indiana jones but it <laughs> certainly uh has its sort of uh fun factor but uh yeah they were they were sort of discovered people were pretty aware of what they were uh almost immediately uh the folks who initially uh found them or uh, uh were in charge of them uh, really kind of kept them under wraps. Uh, initially, the, the location was in Jordan, but uh, after uh, uh, the conflict with, uh, when Israel formed and, and the subsequent conflicts that seceded over, that area seceded over to uh, Israeli control. So there was a bit of political maneuvering going on. Uh, the scholars who initially uh, discovered them were quite hesitant to release them, so there was this big controversy about what they could contain and these secrets that'll bring down the <laughs> Vatican. And it was it was really, uh, if you read some of, of the the stuff at the time, it was quite, it was on par with Indiana Jones meets the Da Vinci Code. So, uh, uh, but nothing, there was nothing, anything that interesting within the collection, unfortunately, or fortunately, as the case may be. Well, if you believe my Facebook feed, that there's something new that would bring down the Vatican every 15 minutes or so. So <laughs> that's true. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if there was something, I would be all over that because that would actually be my academic career. So yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> So we, uh, uh, we've we actually been wanting to do this show for a long time because uh, um, we, we've gotten a lot of questions about the Dead Sea Scrolls yeah, yeah. and um, that there seems to be, like, uh, as opposed to, say, say Nag Hammadi or some other discoveries of ancient texts, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls really seem to have captured the public's imagination, even if people aren't quite sure what they are or what's in them. It's sure. just the kind of thing where I can kind of stop someone on the street and say, have you heard about the Dead Sea Scrolls? And then if they yeah. didn't run away, maybe they would say probably yes. Um, so I, I've heard some different some some stuff, some ideas floating around in pop culture. One yes. is that these uh, these texts prove that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene, and then yeah. something else I heard is these texts prove that Jesus was actually a cipher for a hallucinogenic mushroom. I, I was wondering if, if either of these ideas are true, or where they may have come <laughs> from, or may how they got attached to the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah, um, uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, Jesus was is not shown to be a mushroom or evidence of his uh, marriage to Magdalene uh, in the uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, you know, I it does sort of boggle my mind at, at how um, folks get very excited over the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, versus something like the Nag Hammadi. Uh, usually, uh, I find it's, it's folks of a, of a Christian-centric bent that seem more excited by um, the Dead Sea Scrolls versus the Nag Hammadi, which actually do talk about Jesus. Uh, maybe not the Jesus you're familiar with, but still, uh, Jesus appears quite prominently in these collections. Uh, for me, I've always thought the Dead Sea Scrolls sort of, they provided sort of a cipher 
uh, for people to uh, impose whatever they needed to be or needed to have onto antiquity. That that period in time is is so it's been mined so much by the academic world, the uh, popular culture, religious world, wanting to find out, you know, the true, what Christianity was like, what Judaism was like, where Jesus may or may not have fit in. And the, the scrolls are, they're kind of like Nostradamus. You could mm -hmm. probably make them say almost anything you would want if you're, uh, if you're willing to massage the data. Uh, so yeah, some scholars have, you know, claimed that the, the community is sort of a, uh, the community that produced it was a pre- um, Christian sect that eventually became Christianity. I mean, uh, but there, there really is no evidence of, um, of well, of, of Christianity, of, of quote unquote, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, at the time. I mean, um, we really don't have a Christianity at the time these, these texts were sort of being collected and, and sort of the final collection. We have a bunch of Jesus people, perhaps, uh, of competing stripes, uh, but nobody was, you know, referring to themselves as, you know, Christians, that, that, that's a second century uh, designation. So they were Jews, however you wish to define that. Um, none of them appeared to have any affiliation with uh, uh, any of the constructions of Jesus that, that sort of trickle down from Mushroom that or otherwise. So. Mushroom, especially with the mushroom. Yeah, I, again, I, I really wish there was a mushroom reference, uh, but uh, no, unfortunately. I mean, there's, there is interesting things, but mm -hmm. uh, no Jesus and mushrooms. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, but we need your help. Talk Gnosis and all of the shows on the Gnostic Wisdom Network are free and will always be free, but it does cost us a lot of time and money to actually make these shows. So what I'd like to ask is that if you have enjoyed our programming, if you've found something useful uh, about it, if you've been educated, please consider becoming a patron over on our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash Gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash Gnostic. We've got a whole bunch of new shows that we'd like to start making, but we can't do it until we can start to support ourselves a little bit more financially. And um, we really hope that you will assist us in our goals. Uh, we've got a great show coming up about sex and spirituality with uh, Reverend Mr. Jonathan Stewart from Talk Gnosis and his wife, Sarah Beale. Uh, we've got The Lost Word coming back, Esoteric Freemasonry and Fraternal Orders and initiate, Initiatory Orders and all that kind of thing. We've got Temples and Tentacles uh, with some weird fiction authors, kind of Lovecraftian spirituality stuff that I think you're really going to like. Plus some really interesting kind of fictional and um, uh, kind of entertainment based things that we want to do that also have kind of an esoteric and Gnostic educational component. So please. Uh, we need your help to make all of this possible. We have big dreams, but we don't have a lot of resources to make those dreams a reality. So please do visit patreon.com slash Gnostic if you haven't already and uh, pledge. You just give a small amount of money uh, for every educational media thing that we put out. And then at the end of the month, your, your card gets charged. You can set an upper limit so that you're, ne you're never surprised by uh, too many things getting charged on your card per month. It's really very easy and very painless, and it makes a huge difference to the Gnostic Educational Ministry of the Gnostic Wisdom Network, the Apostolic Joe and I Church, and all of us here who work so hard to bring you this, um, what we think anyway, is pretty great content. So if you agree, that's patreon.com slash Gnostic. Sorry again for the interruption, and back to the show. I get people who will just outright argue with me about what the Dead Sea Scrolls are and, and, then you, and you say well have you read them well no but no, I know yeah. that they say X Y and Z and uh, and the um, people who have heard of Nag Hammadi in passing will often say that one something from Nag Hammadi comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls it's, it always goes that way it never goes the other way no uh, of, course, of course so yeah. Uh, yeah it is they are as you know even though they are um, they were discovered prior to the Nag Hammadi Library. The, um, they're less known for some reason. Um, the, the content is less known. You hear people yeah. talk about the Gospel of Thomas and the Secret Book That's of true. Jonathan. Well, maybe we do because of our circles. Yeah. But. <laughs> Thomas, Thomas does show up. When I bring up the uh, uh, Apocrypha of John, people just look at me like yeah. I've... Uh, 
yeah, sprouted a, a second head off my shoulders or something. So, yeah. yeah. Yes, but super interesting that it does become like this kind of tofu of religious text that it kind of <laughs> it takes on the flavor of whoever's <laughs> using it. Most certainly, yeah. And it, and it, I think it because it doesn't say anything, it, it really can provide a lot of conceptual work for people. Um, there's a reference to uh, a righteous teacher, I think, in, in some of the texts. And, and, and oh, that's got to be Jesus. Well, well, why? Well, because, you know, that, that makes me feel better. You know, like it, it does almost have this um, uh, element that you can import whatever it is you need onto it for it to make sense. And, and you can construct whatever history uh, you wish to have. I mean, popularize uh, popular uh, folks and and also scholars. Uh, a lot of scholarly constructions seem to, unfortunately, do the same thing, um, which I found kind of interesting and, <laughs> yeah, something that I, I tend to harp on a little bit. So, yeah. All right. Well, I think we'll get into a lot more of the kind of conspiracy theory kind of stuff a little <laughs> bit, but let's stick with what they actually talk about. So can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the text in the Dead Sea Scrolls? What do they say? What are their general character? That kind of thing. Sure. Uh, well, uh, I believe uh, some of them are being, I mean, the, they have completely been released as far as I'm, I'm aware, but they, uh, the bulk of them consist of copies uh, of the Hebrew Bible, so the text that we, we have in our, our own uh, translations, uh, and they're quite accurate, or they're accurate in the sense that what we have now is pretty close to what was uh, being uh, scribally reproduced at that point, which is, which is really interesting. Uh, there's a bunch of other uh, unique documents, uh, the Damascus uh, document, the War Scroll, um, tons of these sort of apocalyptic uh, texts where the end times are about to, to happen. Uh, we have junk mail. Uh, there's some uh, texts that were written in Greek. Uh, one is a, a letter praising the Greco-Roman king uh, Jonathan. Uh, we also have a, a lot of copies of uh, the Book of Enoch, mm -hmm. uh, which is really fascinating. Um, it seems that this text uh, not only had a central place for the community who preserved them, but their their own productions were referencing it uh, as well. So uh, it's quite a hodge of, of material, uh, and it is it, it clearly has not been. Um, wasn't collected systematically. It, it seems to have been uh, collected and put together and, and rehashed over, uh, I would say, probably two centuries. So the, uh, you know, second century BC up until, uh, you know, uh, late uh, first century. So uh, it, it is all over the place. It is not a, a coherent collection for sure. Uh, but it is, a, it, it, I mean, again, every sort of possible document uh, an ancient group might have does uh, does show up uh, in there. Um, but I think scholars and, and the popular representations have certainly taken uh, the war scroll, uh, the, the one that, that references the, the end times and apocalyptic battles that, that seems to uh, excite people. Uh, the Damascus document again is sort of how the community formed and, and, the, how, and the book of Enoch that's showing up really through people. Uh, since Enoch seems to have disappeared out of uh, our quote-unquote canon, but seems to have been centrally important to these folks uh, uh, in Qumran. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's quite a collection. If you've ever had the chance, uh, and, it, and there's good, good translations everywhere. I mean, there's the academic scholarly ones, but they tend to be a bit of a yawn. So, uh, but there's quite a bit of popular, uh, easily ac accessible uh, collections for sure. So it's uh, it's hard to summarize what everything uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls actually contains. Right. So so to reiterate, like it is, it is quite a broad collection, as you said, literally two hundred years. But do you see any main themes in in and figures popping up in the text? Does there seem to be any the thematic connections and narrative connections, or is it really just a grab bag? Um, there are some, I think, not. I don't know how uh, intentional the thematic collections were. Uh, again, uh, if you have, you know, multiple copies or versions of the Book of Enoch, for instance, or the the uh, um, uh, that's going to have similar themes, will show up for sure. Uh, there does seem to be uh, an apocalyptic um, bent to the text, but not exclusively. 
uh, the, the groups, uh, one of the interesting things is a calendar. They seem to be very obsessed with keeping track of dates uh, and sort of figuring out the ritual purity, uh, as opposed to the folks who were uh, practicing in uh, Jerusalem at the temple. So um, they were very interested in sort of maintaining, a, 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 it seems to be a separate interpretation of Judaism's uh, but not within the temple itself. Um, so yeah, th there's, it, it's quite diverse. Uh, the languages uh, go from, you know, there's, there's Hebrew, of course, there's Greek, um, there's uh, um, a, a whole variety of, of sort of uh, languages that would have been spoken in the intellectual circles at the time. So um, predominantly Hebrew, uh, I should make that clear, but uh, there is some Greek uh, stuff certainly in there too. So uh, it is a bit of a hodgepodge, unfortunately. Um, but I don't know if that's unfortunate. I think that makes it more interesting, personally. <laughs> mm -hmm. What What are some of the uh, the theories of the community that that did produce them? So uh, they, you know they were discovered in caves in Qumran. Uh, so did somebody wrote them and collected them. So the, I guess the assumption is is that there is a community that created them. Sure. And just sort of uh, that I'm sure there's probably a few theories, but you know kind of in the pop culture, I hear that the Essenes come up a lot. Yeah, yeah, the Essenes are sort of the I would even say they're the the dominant um, uh, culprit in, in the uh, production and uh, preservation uh, of the text. Uh, it's it's interesting because much like the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes we don't know very much about them, so they seem to fit as a cipher uh, for other things. I mean, they you know, some scholars, uh, Lawrence Schiffman uh, in particular, wanted them to be the Sadducees, uh, and he would you know. There's evidence that they could have been, but it doesn't quite fit. And, you know, same with the Pharisees. They, they could have been a, a rogue or a, a separate group of Pharisees. And I'm sure that kind of fits sometimes too, but not always. And same with the Essenes. Our, our evidence of the Essenes are uh, predominantly from Josephus. And, uh, yeah, they, there seems to be some overlap with that too, but not quite either. So um, our, you know, the, the folks who produced them um, could have been one of those groups, but however they constructed themselves and how they uh, maintain themselves certainly is distinct from who we think it is. Um, again, some of the other ones are, you know, uh, I've heard, what was the last one I heard? It was the, the group uh, that followed John the Baptist uh, must have uh, had those uh, in that group. And I'm like, mm -hmm, clearly, um, you know, it's, 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 no, I mean, that just, that just seems uh, uh, beyond the realm to me. Um, I, I've called them the Ahad because that's the term that they use. Mm -hmm. uh, for themselves. And I, it strikes me as it, it doesn't mean, that way I don't have to say, well, they're a scene ish or mm -hmm. Pharisee-like. I, I can kind of let them um, use their own term of definition. And, and that, that, uh, you know, that avoids the, uh, a lot of the, the hand-wringing that you get in, in scholarly circles. So, yeah, um, so yeah it, it, who they were, they were, they were certainly... Um, folks who we would say are Jews uh, of the time, uh, however you want to define it, Judaisms of the period, uh, but they don't neatly slot into any of the classifications that we have. Um, so they they kind of serve a, a really interesting place, I think, a uh, really fascinating uh, construction of what was Judaism uh, at that period. Yeah, just like the various flavors of Judaism today, you know, it has never really been a monotheistic or monolithic religion. It has been a sure. monotheistic religion. It has not been yeah. a monolithic yeah. religion uh, in the same sure. way that Christianity isn't either. Most certainly. And, and even back in uh, the time before the, the temple's fall, I mean, we had a huge variety of, of what constituted Judaisms that uh, did not conform to the sort of rabbinical norm that, that, that evolved out of it. I mean, after the temple was destroyed, there essentially was two groups of Jews that remained, the sort of um, what we call a rabbinic Judaism, and uh, the rest sort of faded away. But we had the, you know, the Alexandrian uh, types of Jews who practiced magic and exercised demons. And, um, All the fun the stuff happened in Alexandria. Yeah, and, and we didn't have the same sort of, uh, you know, Yahoo-ness going on uh, in Qumran, but they, they, were, they were pretty uh, intrigued with, uh, you know, dealing with uh, the battle of the end times, and they were, they were pretty ready to go. They were going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with whoever that happened to be. So, um, yeah, they, are, they certainly open up our eyes of what could have been Judaism uh, for antiquity. 
uh, which I think is fascinating as somebody who's interested in classification and, and sort of repackaging what we talk about. It, it really, uh, I found it utterly uh, intriguing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so, so yeah, yeah. How, what we call them, I, the, the Essene hypothesis is, is probably the most popular, but it, it certainly doesn't, um, uh, it's not as convincing, I, I think, as, as sort of we are given. Uh, it's sort of been left lying in the dirt and nobody uh, will, will dig into it. But I, I, I do think there's, there's more work on who they could have been, or, or actually a good question is why it must be the Essenes. Mm -hmm.